Washington and Moscow. Russian President Vladimir Putin says relations have deteriorated since Donald Trump took office. On a professional level, it's disappointing because I think I, I've, I've let the president down. The White House press secretary says he regrets the comments he made about Hitler yesterday. While talking about the war in Syria, Sean Spicer implied the Nazi leader never used poison gas on his own people. We're waiting to go live this hour to Ottawa for a special ceremony recognizing Malala Yousafzai. She's going to be given honorary Canadian citizenship. You can see there in the foyer of the House of Commons, the stage is set for that uh, uh, welcoming party. Malala Yousafzai will also address Parliament to today, the youngest person ever to do so. Michael Serapio is working on the story. And uh, for those who want a refresher on Malala's courageous story, why don't you give it to us, Michael? Well, you know, and that's imp an important part to uh, make here, Sahana, because, you know, she is getting this rare honor being named a citizen of this country without actually being uh, living in this country. But Malala really is an international hero. And she was a person that we didn't really hear of until 2012, uh, just five years ago, when, you, when Malala was essentially targeted by the Taliban and shot in the head, singled out for her vocal support of a girl's right to an education. It was her diary on the uh, BBC Urdu website that is, it gave her uh, some international attention, became very popular while she was undergoing surgery and recovery in the UK. She co-wrote an international bestseller called I Am Malala 2014. As you noted uh, in the introduction there, she became the youngest Nobel Peace Prize laureate, an honor that was just followed up on Monday when Yusuf Sai became the youngest person ever to be named a UN messenger of peace. And, you know, I, to quote her, because you remember uh, it, in her address to the UN, that wonderful quote where she said, if the Taliban was trying to silence her, they failed. She remains unsilenced, and now millions of voices around the world are raised up, all for the right of a young girl to get an education, Sahana. And how are girls around the world, Michael, benefiting from Malala's work? Well, beyond being this incredible role model, which is uh, what she continues to be to so many people, there have been a number of different scholarships that have been essentially given out around the world to encourage young girls to pursue their education. There's certainly what is one here in Canada, for example, at uh, King's College in Halifax. Uh, there's also one by the Malala Yousafzai Foundation itself, and it gives scholarships to young girls around the world so that they can become leaders in their community. It interesting the impact of that being felt well beyond uh, the borders of the UK where they now live but also in home country of Pakistan take a listen to one uh, recipient who talked about the importance of a, in a country like Pakistan to get a buy-in from the fathers so that young girls may get their education and stand on their own take a listen usually there, there are lots of places where where there is male dominance so uh, like and those places, when the men, men make the wise decision to educate their girls, to educate their daughters, they can make a big change in society. A big change in society. We should note uh, this rare honor of getting this honorary citizenship. Malala Yousafzai is only the sixth to do so. Ahead of her was Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, the Dalai Lama, Nelson Mandela, the Aga Khan, uh, and Raoul Wallenberg, a Swedish diplomat who helped save uh, tens of thousands of Jews in no Nazi-occupied Hungary. So she stands in great company as she goes to the House of Commons today, Sahana. Thank you, Michael. You're we'll welcome. watch for it. We had a report earlier from Washington on the attempts by the U.S. and Russia to work out a new relationship. The U.S. Secretary of State, as you know, is in Moscow right now. We were wondering whether Vladimir Putin was going to meet with him. In fact, he is meeting with the Russian president. The Russians had expected good relations after the election of Donald Trump, but then Syria, you might say, got in the way. Charles Maines has more from Moscow. They're, I think, quite surprised by this shift from the Trump White House on the issue of Assad in particular. Uh, if you recall, candidate Trump, and even in the early days of his presidency, uh, Donald Trump really expressed no interest in the future of Assad and the fate of Assad. He was interested in teaming with Russia, perhaps in some kind of global coalition to destroy the Islamic State, Mr. Trump's stated uh, primary goal, uh, what he says is in the uh, United States national interest. Uh, of course, this has all been a bit, uh, this idea of some kind of of grand bargain with Russia has been a little bit uh, hampered by the 
so to put it mildly, hampered by the election scandal, this idea that Russia somehow meddled in the election to get uh, Donald Trump elected. We've seen a lot of his uh, White House staff make very aggressive statements towards the Russians, which has not uh, which has not been received here well in Moscow. Um, I, you know, obviously the Russians are against these uh, missile strikes that the Trump, that Trump carried out against uh, Assad uh, last week. Uh, Mr. Putin, the Russian president, uh, called it an act of aggression. Uh, but today we heard from uh, the foreign minister, as these two uh, foreign ministers, as, as Tillerson and uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov met in Moscow, uh, we heard from uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. He made uh, quite conciliatory remarks, but also with a little bit of a barb. But let's listen to that clip. We have reiterated multiple times that we are prepared for a constructive, equal footing and a good dialogue with consideration for our legitimate interests. And Charles, how is that message being analyzed there? Mr. Tillerson came here saying that this was Moscow's choice, whether they were with the West or whether they were with the Assad regime. Uh, this is, of course, Russia's ally. I think Russia's also somewhat surprised and taken aback by comments from Mr. Tillerson ahead of this meeting that essentially the, the days of the Assad regime were numbered. Uh, Vladimir Putin, certainly his government sees this as a call for regime change, something they've been very vehement against. Uh, I think they're also insulted by some of the comments from Mr. Tillerson that somehow Russia had been duped by Assad, that they hadn't managed to secure this, this uh, 2013 agreement as the guarantor that Mr. Assad would give up his chemical weapons. So all these ideas, I think, are going to play and make it even more difficult for these two sides to bridge their differences. The Bank of Canada has a warning for everyone who owes money or plans to borrow some. Interest rates may rise sooner than expected. Jeannie Lee is here with all of the details. So sooner, but not right now. Not correct? right this minute, not today, and not for months, Suhanna. Uh, as expected, the Bank of Canada left its key overnight rate alone at 0.5%, where it's been for 21 months now. You'll remember the bank trimmed interest rates twice after the collapse of oil prices in 2014, and it's kept borrowing costs super low just to get the economy uh, back on uh, track in terms of a recovery. Um, and in fact, the bank thinks that that is now happening. It's bumped up its growth forecast for this year, 2017, to 2.6%. It was thinking that maybe we would get 2.1% growth mm -hmm. this year. So that's a big bump up. Now, uh, it's signaling that things could be... Uh, better or in shape for a rate hike sooner than it might have uh, moved. And that will be next year. That a lot of economists were thinking the next rate hike will happen in late 2018. But now this could be a signal that it will happen, say, in the spring of 2018, meaning a year from mm -hmm. now. So again, you know, people who have a lot of mon uh, borrowed money on their books, um, you know, are getting another warning that they have time to kind of chip away at that principle that they owe so that when rates go up, it will be less onerous. And that is the reaction we're getting today. What's the reaction on the markets, Jeannie, with the Canadian dollar? Oh, yeah, we are certainly seeing a bump up there as, uh, you know, uh, investors react to this uh, early warning that interest rates in Canada may rise a few months earlier than first predicted. So the Canadian dollar at 75.34 cents U.S., up a third of a cent. Now, the West Texas oil price, that's the U.S. benchmark, at 53.30, holding pretty steady right there. Gold, though, at about a five-month high at 12.80.40. Uh, some were about geopolitical uh, you know, uncertainties, still uh, pulling up the price of gold, that safe haven investment. And here's a quick look at stocks, moderate losses all across the board. Thank you, Jeannie. You're welcome. We are getting closer to a live event. Malala Yousafzai uh, arriving at Parliament Hill. She's going to be honoured today. She will become an honorary Canadian citizen. You can see our Prime Minister standing there waiting as part of the welcome committee. Yousafzai is only 19 years old. She's going to address a joint session of Parliament as well in the House of Commons. We're going to carry it live for you right here on CBC News Network. You're watching CBC News Network.
this incredible world uh, figure, uh, human rights uh, activist, Nobel Prize winner in their school answering some of their questions. So, uh, Justin Trudeau taking her now to that uh, guest book there in Confederation Hall. She is, as you know, a champion of girls' education. She's only 19 years old, and there she is signing in. This will be the next honorary Canadian citizen, only the sixth to receive such an honour by our country's parliament. She's going to address a, uh, the Senate and the House of Commons, so a joint session of parliament as well. That is expected to happen in about 20 to 30 minutes. We're going to hear an introduction from the Prime Ministers. Now, the House, of course, unanimously supported granting Malala honorary citizenship. This was back in 2014. It was under the previous government, the Conservative government. There was a ceremony that was scheduled in that year to happen in Toronto, but then, of course, the unexpected happened with the Parliament Hill shootings. And as you know, uh, a gunman shot and killed reservist Nathan Cirillo back in October of 2014 at the National War Memorial. That put this event off. It is unfolding today, right now. One of the things Malala said was that she is looking forward to visiting what she called a great nation of heroes. And for many in this welcoming line, she's the hero. She's the inspiration that has led many young people to take action for equality and for education here in Canada. I spoke with one of those young women at an Ottawa high school earlier today, and she's going to be in the gallery listening to this joint address to Parliament by this young uh, Malala Yousafzai. 19 years old right now. She was only 15 when she was shot in the head by a masked gunman. And she was born in Pakistan. And uh, she became a co-recipient in 2014 of the Nobel Peace Prize, the youngest person to ever earn that distinction. And she was recently appointed as a UN Messenger of Peace by the United, United Nations Secretary General. That is the highest honor given by that world body. And today she gets another honor. So the accolades just keep building. Meeting there with Green Party leader Elizabeth May. Um, but the accolades, as I say, keep building because today she becomes number six uh, only ever honorary Canadian citizen. And quite the list there. The Aga Khan in 2010, Aung San Suu Kyi, Burmese democracy advocate in 2007, the year before that, the Dalai Lama. In 2001, you certainly know this name, international love affair with this man, Nelson Mandela. And in 1985, posthumously for a Swedish diplomat, Raoul Wallenberg, for his actions during the Holocaust. And now Malala Yousafzai will be added to that list. Number six, 2017, on this day in April, she will become an honorary Canadian citizen and the youngest person to be given uh, the uh, great uh, privilege of addressing the Parliament of Canada. So she's going to go into the House of Commons right now with the Prime Minister. There will be more handshakes, more meeting and greeting. We've got uh, that all Please covered right for you. Uh, in Trudeau, the library, is this, is this where we are right now? Evan Dyer has also been watching. He can, he can join me as well. Evan, why don't you pick up here as to what's happening? Well, we're now looking at the library of the Houses of Parliament. So after coming in uh, with the Prime Minister through the rotunda, signing that book, uh, and meeting with the speakers of the two houses, the acting sergeant of arms. She then uh, moved on and had to shake hands with another row of dignitaries who were the party leaders in the House uh, and Senate and a few other people like the foreign affairs critic of the NDP, Hélène Laverdière. Uh, and now she's in the library. This is where she's actually going to get her certificate of honorary Canadian citizenship uh, before going into the chamber of the House of Commons behind me uh, where she'll give her speech. And, Already they've put seats on the floor of the House of Commons to accommodate all the senators because this is a joint session uh, that's going to listen to Malala speak. As we saw, I think the last occasion we saw a joint session here listening to a foreign dignitary would have been President Barack Obama on his last visit to Ottawa. He uh, just standing behind Malala Yousafzai there. We've got some other young people. There is a yep. choir there. They've got to be just, uh, you know, pinching themselves to be part of this ceremony today. 
Yes, I mean, obviously, Malala's you know, message is primarily aimed at young people, and it's primarily about education, and that's what her own uh, life story is so much about. And we saw actually a pretty uh, interesting scene this morning at a high school here in Ottawa, Ridgemont High, uh, which had Malala in to speak to the students in a morning assembly. And uh, perhaps the, the nicest part of that was that they chose to surprise the students. The students arrived at school uh, this morning without knowing that it was going to be a day different from other days and they were uh, ushered into an assembly and there they were uh, first addressed by uh, two cabinet ministers, Maria Monsef and Marie-Claude Bibo, the Minister of International Development, uh, and they then introduced uh, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, who uh, was probably another person they weren't expecting to see at their school this morning, and she then introduced Malala, who uh, spoke to them for quite a while this morning uh, and uh, gave them a talk about her upbringing in the Swat Valley, about her mission, the importance of education, uh, and, uh, and had quite a, quite a good question and answer session with some of those students. But the ones we're looking at now here in the library, as you mentioned, are a choir. And uh, once the speeches are done, right now we're looking at Ahmed Hussein uh, speaking, cabinet minister. Uh, once that's done, we're going to hear a, a little bit of, uh, of singing. And then after that, the ceremony will move over to the House of Commons. We'll just take a moment and listen in live as well, Evan, as this unfolds sure. in the library. Admiration of Canadians everywhere. You've become an important figure in the critical international struggle for the rights of girls to education and against the suppression of the rights of youth. Canadians are delighted that you have accepted the honour of not only becoming our sixth ever honorary Canadian citizen, but also the youngest ever honorary citizen of this country. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the Right Honourable Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to present the certificate to our distinguished honorary Canadian. Thank you very much. its newest citizen, an honorary role, definitely, but like an honor, Malala Yousafzai. Justin Trudeau, Premier Minister of Canada, for a few words. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you all for gathering here to mark this historic occasion. Today, we proudly bestow honorary Canadian citizenship on Malala Yousafzai, a young woman from Pakistan who has done tremendous things for the people of her country and for the children of the world. Comme vous le savez, Malala devait se joindre à nous en octobre 2014, mais son voyage a été repoussé après l'horrible fusillade qui a eu lieu au monument commémoratif de guerre ici sur la colline du Parlement. C'est donc un énorme privilège pour nous de finalement l'accueillir dans le cadre de cette cérémonie et de lui décerner fièrement la citoyenneté canadienne à titre honorifique. Malala, Malala est la sixième personne seulement à recevoir cette distinction et elle se joint à certains des héros les plus influents et les plus respectés du monde. Malala, your story is an inspiration to us all. The violence you survived at the hands of the Taliban didn't deter you as it would have for so many others. Rather, you stood even stronger in the face of oppression, your passion for justice only intensified. When you addressed the UN in 2013, you said, we realize the importance of light when we see darkness. We realize the importance of our voice when we are silenced. Malala Yousafzai, for bravely lending your voice to so many, we thank you. And from this day forward, we are all proud to call you Canadian. Monsieur le Premier ministre va maintenant présenter à Malala le drapeau de la Tour de la Paix. Prime Minister Trudeau will now present to Malala the Canadian Peace Tower flag. Maintenant, pour chanter l'hymne national, voici le cœur régional de la jeunesse d'Ottawa. To sing our national anthem, here's the Ottawa Regional Youth Choir.
Merci beaucoup au Chœur régional de la Jeunesse d'Ottawa, c'était magnifique. J'inviterai maintenant Malala au podium. As the father of a one-year-old girl, I look forward to one day bragging to her that I was once able to say the words, Malala, it would be an honor for you to come to the podium for a few words. Thank you so much to Prime Minister Trudeau people of Canada for this incredible honor. I'm honored to be given this honor of the honorary citizenship of Canada. And I accept it as proud citizen of Pakistan and as a proud Pashtun. And it is not just honorary citizenship of Canada, but it is also being Canada's friend. And I warmly accept it. And I want to thank Canada for its passion, for girls' education, for its passion, for humanity, for refugees, and for standing up for women's rights and for peace. And I'm really excited to be here to meet you all. And you are a true example to the world of what it means to stand up for humanity. And I'm hopeful that you will inspire many more countries and many more leaders to follow your footsteps. And I am hopeful that together through our work, we can ensure that every girl can get quality education. That is my mission, and I'm sure that you all will join me in this cause. Uh, once again, I'm really thankful, and, um, and this, is, this is an honor and a great opportunity to see Prime Minister Trudeau because everyone was excited, uh, especially all the people I was seeing in, like, in the UK, in the US, everyone was saying, are you meeting Trudeau? And, uh, like, shake his hand, so, yeah, I've done it. And I uh, met Trudeau. It's finally done. Uh, so I want to say that Trudeau is an amazing person, an inspiration, and uh, a person who is standing up uh, without any fear for feminism, for women's rights, for equality, and who is standing up among a time and during a time where the world is hopeless. Prime Minister is coming forward speaking out for refugees and women. So he is a true example, and I'm sure that other world leaders will learn from him. Thank you. Je regarde autour de moi et euh, bien qu'on soit entouré de livres, je crois qu'il en manque un. Et Malala va offrir celui qu'elle a écrit à la bibliothécaire parlementaire, Mme Sonia Lheureux. I feel like this library might be missing one book. Malala, would you do this building the honor of presenting your book to Mrs. Sonia Lheureux, parliamentary librarian? C'est ce qui conclut notre cérémonie. J'inviterai le Premier ministre et Malala à se rendre à l'allocution au Parlement. This concludes our ceremony. Thanks for being here. I'd like to invite the Prime Minister and Malala to make their way to the address. Just the first part of a very busy morning for this 19-year-old 
firecracker, Malala Yousafzai. She has just been made and accepted the high honor of becoming an honorary Canadian citizen. And she said, I want to thank Canada for standing up for women's rights and for peace. She went on to say, I accept it as a proud citizen of Pakistan. And also what caused the crowd there in the library to giggle a little, she said very humbly that in the UK where she had uh, flown in from, the people there when she talked to them about receiving this honor in Canada, they were very excited about the fact that she would be meeting our Prime Minister. And she said, uh, uh, now they were asking me, would I meet Justin Trudeau? Would I shake his hand? And she said, I shook his hand, yes, so now I've done it. And there was quite a little giggle there in the library. Um, and again, presenting her book, I Am Malala, to the parliamentary librarian. So now uh, all of these distinguished guests will be moving into the House of Commons, the parliamentarians, etc. And uh, Malala will be addressing a joint session of the parliament. Also in the gallery, there are some great yeah. young people who are waiting eagerly for those words. Evan Dyer has been watching all of this unfold. He is in our nation's capital. And as they prepare the House, uh, Evan, for this address to parliament, who's up in the gallery? Well, the public gallery uh, is pretty full. It's full of uh, there's some some high school kids there. Actually, my daughter made her way over here, uh, and I can tell you she was so excited to see Malala. I'm not sure she even noticed Justin Trudeau, uh, but she's up there in the gallery with uh, a pretty full house. Uh, the floor of the Parliament building, of rather I should say, of the Chamber of the Commons, is also full because it's been filled with temporary seating to accommodate uh, senators and a few other guests as well. Uh, we're expecting to see a pretty full house in there, too. I should mention on an interesting note, actually, that Ahmed Hussain, uh, the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, who uh, was, of course, on hand for this what is a citizenship ceremony of a kind, uh, it is himself, of course, a former refugee, as is Malala. And uh, Malala was displaced from her home in the Swat Valley uh, back in 2010 when the Pakistan Army came in to free it from the Taliban. It had been under Taliban occupation for quite a while. Uh, and uh, she was not only displaced from her home, but the family was also separated for a while. So she's had some experience of what it means to be a refugee. And uh, there she was receiving her uh, Canadian citizenship from a minister of citizenship who, who's had the same experience. And you know what? This is one, uh, Evan, on a long list of accolades yep. that Malala Yousafzai uh, has received. Uh, just walk me through some of them. Well, actually, she was, she became the world's youngest Nobel Peace Prize winner in uh, 2014, just a few days, really, before she was scheduled to come here and receive this honorary citizenship uh, in Canada in 2014. And, of course, that uh, ceremony was postponed because of the shooting here on Parliament Hill occurring the same day. Malala was actually scheduled uh, to get her citizenship in Toronto from Stephen Harper, not here in the Houses of Parliament. But, of course, that day, as everyone can recall, uh, was a major scare, a lot of security, everything was locked down, not only here in Ottawa, and that function had to be cancelled. Uh, but she's also become, okay. in addition to a Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, the UN's youngest ever ambassador thank of peace. Evan, thank you, Evan. Okay. You're watching this unfold on CBC News Network. We are back in just a moment. Malala Yousafzai is getting a rock star welcome on Parliament Hill. This hour, the Nobel Peace Prize co-winner will address the House of Commons. She is now an honorary Canadian citizen. Hello, everyone. I'm Suhana Marchand. This is CBC News Network. We can better understand why these differences exist and what the prospects for narrowing those differences may be. Rex Tillerson continues his negotiations with Russia's foreign minister. The U.S. Secretary of State says he wants to better understand the conflicts between Washington and Moscow. Russian President Vladimir Putin says he may still meet Tillerson later on. Further clarify areas. On a professional level, it's disappointing because I think I, I've, I've let the president down. Sean Spicer says his gaffe about Hitler 
is inexcusable. While he was talking about the war in Syria yesterday, the White House press secretary implied the Nazi leader never used poison gas on his own people. Spicer has been getting slammed for minimizing Hitler's crimes. And the CFL commissioner is stepping down. The league announced it has agreed to part ways with Jeffrey Orridge. In March of 2015, Orridge became the first African-American to head up a major North American sports league. Taking you live, this is in the House of Commons, and uh, you can see the hustle and bustle as they're all preparing for quite an extraordinary event. Just moments ago, 19-year-old Malala Yousafzai was, uh, became the recipient of an honorary Canadian citizenship, which she humbly accepted, and she thanked Canada for standing up for women's rights, for standing up for refugees, for standing up for peace. Then she made her way into the House of Commons, where she is going to be um, another, uh, if you will, feather in her cap, and that is the youngest person to ever address the House of Commons. She will be speaking before members of the Senate and uh, members of the House, so a joint session of Parliament. She arrived just about 30 minutes ago with her mum and her dad. She was greeted by uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, signed the guest book in the rotunda, then she received her honorary Canadian citizenship and was also a recipient of the uh, Peace Tower flag presented to her uh, as well. And she presented her book, I Am Malala, to the parliamentary librarian, which is where that event unfolded. And now we're looking at the preparations in the House. Evan Dyer is also watching all of this. He joins me live from our nation's capital. I bet you can feel the buzz in the air there, Evan. Well, it's going on right behind me here through these doors. Uh, yes, it's a very full house. We've seen people filing in uh, for quite a while. These, uh, we're not expecting to see too many empty seats in there today. The order uh, of appearance will be, again, a presentation by Prime Minister Trudeau. He'll make some brief remarks. Then we're expecting to hear uh, from Malala again, and this will be her main address, those sort of off-the-cuff remarks uh, that she made when she received her citizenship document were just sort of uh, an impromptu speech she gave there in the library. Her main speech will be here and will probably run 20 to 25 minutes. And then there'll be some comments too from the Speaker uh, of the Senate, followed by the Speaker of the House. And at that point, the House will rise. Uh, but Malala won't be done here in Parliament. She's going to have uh, a meeting and a photo op with the Prime Minister in his office just upstairs from here. And then later in the afternoon, she'll also meet with the Leader of the Opposition, Rana Ambrose. Uh, and that's partly because Ron Ambrose had a lot to do with today's ceremony. This, of course, as we were just saying, was something that was originally planned back in 2014 under the previous government. And Ron Ambrose, who was a cabinet minister in the Harper government, was, uh, had a big role in, in inviting Malala here and arranging for her to become an honorary Canadian citizen. Uh, and so Malala is going to meet with her later this afternoon after she's done with the prime minister. Evan, uh, what we're seeing on the screens right now are uh, politicians, uh, and, and they're not kids, uh, but Malala is about young people. She is yep. about uh, inspiring young people uh, not only to help others, but to help themselves to, to fulfill their potential, to go to school and continue their education. There are young people listening. They're live in the house, are there not? That's right, there are. There's, uh, some, there were young people in the rotunda waiting for her to come through. She stopped and uh, quite a few of them were, were taking pictures with their phones, but she shaked a few hands as well. Uh, and of course she was at a school earlier today. We also know there are some uh, school kids up in the public gallery at the far end of the house. Perhaps in fact on that shot we can see uh, some of them right there. That, that is I believe the public gallery uh, that we're seeing right there or it may be the other end, but in any case all of the galleries are full today, as they are on these occasions, which don't happen very often. I mean, as you've mentioned, uh, the number of people who've addressed joint sessions of the House and Senate is only half a dozen. The number of people who've become honorary Canadian citizens is the same number. So this is not a common event. Uh, and that uh, group in which she now finds herself, the yeah. honorary Canadian citizens of which she is number six, who are some of the others, Evan? Well, they include uh, the Aga Khan. He was the last one to be given uh, an honorary Canadian citizenship. That would have been about uh, three years ago. Prior to him, uh, we saw Nelson Mandela become an honorary Canadian citizen, I believe. And 
Uh, one, at least one has been awarded posthumously, which was the Swedish diplomat uh, Raoul Wallenberg, who saved so many Jews from the Holocaust while he was a diplomat in Hungary. And then, of course, after the war, he disappeared. We believe he was abducted by uh, the NKVD, which became the KGB. But Canada went on to make him a Canadian citizen many years later. It's not, a, it's not an honor that's awarded a lot. Uh, and when it is, it, they really do tend to pull out the stops here on Parliament. We just saw her mom and dad, uh, and they, of course, arrived on Parliament Hill with Malala. And I've interviewed yep. her father, who, again, a very humble man. When you look at this daughter who has done so much, she yep. says he and her, and her mom have also been in her corner, if you will, and supporting uh, these um, decisions that she's making as a young woman. Um, her mom was wearing yeah. a blue hijab. We did see Malala earlier. She's got an orange hijab on, and she... Uh, had, as you said, made an impromptu speech accepting that honorary Canadian citizenship. I just want to take our viewers back to that moment because it is a rare moment, Evan. Number six only, and you went through some of the others who are honorary Canadian citizens. It unfolded in the library, and uh, Prime Minister Trudeau gave her, there's her mom waving right now, of course, and her dad just in the center of your screen uh, talking there. Actually, we're going, we're going to stick with this, I suppose. We're not going to go to that footage of uh, Malala receiving the honorary Canadian citizenship. But if you are just joining us, we are giving you this live look inside the House of Commons because it's a very historic day. The, um, the youngest person ever to address Canada's House of Parliament will do so today. And here she is uh, receiving that honorary Canadian citizenship. 19-year-old Malala Yousafzai, born in Pakistan, a co-recipient in 2014 of the Nobel Peace Prize. When she was 15, I'm sure you know this story, Malala was shot in the head by a masked gunman. She persevered in her determination to inspire young women to go to school, and she continues to do that right now as a high school student in the United Kingdom. And there she is receiving the Peace Tower flag from the Prime Minister and being serenaded by uh, young people in our nation's capital there in the choir. On the left of your screen, you can see the live shot of the House of Commons. That is getting uh, underway to uh, hear the address from Malala Yousafzai. We're hearing it will be about 15 minutes. And as Evan Dyer, my colleague in Ottawa, had mentioned, there will be an introduction from the Prime Minister to this incredibly inspiring young woman. In the gallery, we have young people from uh, schools in the area who are there to listen. Earlier today, I interviewed one of them. I'm going to give a shout out to Emma Boys, who is uh, attending an Ottawa high school. Sophie, uh, the Prime Minister's wife, arriving. Malala Yousafzai in the middle and flanked on the other side by our Prime Minister into the House of Commons. Let's just give this a, a moment and listen in to the applause. It was a unanimous decision back in October of 2014 to ensure Malala was recipient of an honorary Canadian citizenship. And today we're seeing the fruition of that. It was, of course, uh, the former government under Stephen Harper, uh, which that came to be. And because of the events that happened in October with the Parliament Hill shootings, that was pushed back today we're seeing it become a reality. Malala Yousafzai is now Canada's citizen. We can call her our own. It is honorary. But nonetheless, she said, I humbly accept it earlier in an event in the Parliamentary Library. Flanked by Sophie Gregoire, the Prime Minister's wife, and, of course, Justin Trudeau on her left. The applause continues with a standing ovation in the House of Commons. She is about to address them. Her mom and dad joined her as well on this visit to Canada.
Le très honorable Premier ministre, the right honorable Prime Minister. Honored guests, parliamentarians, colleagues, and friends. It is a pleasure to be here today to host one of the newest and possibly bravest citizens of Canada, Malala Yousafzai. Malala, it is a privilege to welcome you to our house. And now that you're an honorary Canadian, I hope you'll consider this your house, too. Welcome. Malala's story is one we know well. It is both exceptional and familiar, out of this world and, sadly, commonplace. Years ago, we heard all about this bold, brave girl from Swat Valley who stood up to the Taliban. A whip-smart, politically engaged 12-year-old who was inspiring other kids to raise their voices and lead by example. A girl whose greatest want in life was to go to school. A girl who refused to be silenced with hope we stood in awe of her. And with horror, we watched as cowards tried to take her life. And still, as the world prayed while she recovered, we were reminded that a bullet is no match for an idea. That, that in the face of evil, what is right and what is good will always prevail. Malala. Malala, you said that you wished no ill on the man who tried to kill you. In so doing, you showed enormous goodness. And goodness is something Canadians sometimes recognize in themselves. Just a few months ago, we witnessed a terrorist attack against a mosque in Quebec City. This senseless act of violence left six innocent people dead, husbands, fathers, and sons. And yet, even after this crime, Canadians remained united. We didn't turn against each other. We didn't divide into factions. We didn't give in to hatred or fear. We took the same positive approach that we always endeavor to take as Canadians. We showed the world that we would not meet violence with violence, but that we would meet fear and hatred with love and compassion. Malala, you are a model of kindness through your words as well as your actions. And that is something that resonates not only with Canadians, but with the rest of the world as well. Yours is a story of an ordinary girl doing extraordinary things, an everyday hero, a trailblazer, and a teenager, a renegade, and a reader, a fearless advocate, and a girl who wants nothing more than to see more kids in classrooms. And on top of that, you're impossibly humble. We Canadians are all about that. 
When you accepted the Nobel Peace Prize, you said, I tell my story not because it is unique, but because it is not. And when you spoke at the UN, you said, I raise up my voice not so that I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the true embodiment of leadership and service. We should all wish to serve so honorably in our own lifetimes. Malala, you have given light to boys and girls mired in darkness. And you have challenged women and men of all backgrounds to be better so that we may do better. And one area where we must all do better is in educating our young people. We know that only through education can we achieve true peace. I say that not only as a husband, father, and community member, I first and foremost say that as a teacher. I was lucky enough to teach some really great kids in BC for five years, and they taught me that going to school is about more than just learning how to read and write. It's about challenging your worldview. It's about innovation. And it's about solving problems by working together. Education has the power to change the world. It can end poverty, fight climate change, prevent wars. But in order to achieve progress, we all have to make sure that all children, girls as well as boys, get to go to school. I couldn't imagine a world where my sons, Xavier and Hadrian, could enjoy the gift of learning, but my daughter, Ella Grace, could not. She, like so many other little girls, loves to learn, and she'd be devastated if she had that right taken from her. It's no secret that women and girls have always had to fight, and still have to fight, for things that men often take for granted. The right to vote. The right to serve one's country. The right to equal pay. The right to choose when to start a family. Unfortunately, if I were to finish this list, it would take me all day. And yet, any society, if it is to succeed, requires the full participation of women and girls. And that starts always with education. Here in Canada, we ensure that our children have the skills they need to have a fulfilling life in this ever-changing world. As Minister for Youth and as a father of young children, Education is a priority for me. Last month, we announced funding for a new program that will help teach children the basics of coding as well as digital skills. We are helping more teenagers from low-income communities finish their secondary studies. We are investing in programs that encourage young people to take an interest in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, boys and girls. Building and repairing schools to ensure that every Indigenous student living on reserve receives a good education. For too long, these children have been neglected. That's unacceptable, and we must do more. For the sake of girls and boys around the world, for the sake of our future, the time to act is now.
My friends, we know that progress starts as an idea rooted in conviction, brought to life by the right words, and driven into action with courage. We call on our brothers and sisters around the world to speak boldly and without fear, knowing in their hearts that the right words at the right time can make change happen. Malala, you chose hope. You chose dignity. You chose determination. And children around the world, thank you for it. Today, in this country and in this chamber, we honor you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is my great privilege to introduce to you a champion for education and a fearless new Canadian, Malala Yousafzai. Rahim, in the name of God, the most merciful, the most beneficent. Good afternoon, bonjour, assalamu alaikum, bakhair Mr. Prime Minister, Madam Trudeau, Sophie, uh, Mr. Speaker, members of the House, members of the Senate, distinguished guests, my parents, Ziauddin and Torpikai. And finally, the people of Canada, thank you so much for the warm welcome to your country. This is my first trip to Canada, but not my first attempt. On the 22nd of October, 2014, my father and I landed at the Toronto airport, excited for a first visit to your wonderful country. Soon we learned that a man had attacked Parliament Hill, killing a Canadian soldier, wounding others, and threatening leaders and civil servants in the building where I stand today. Canadian security officials and professionals advised us to reschedule. With sorrow in our hearts, we headed back to England, promising to return to Canada one day. The man who attacked Parliament Hill called himself a Muslim, but he did not share my faith. He did not share the faith of one and a half billion Muslims living in peace around the world. Sorry, the podium became too high, so I'm short-sighted. I couldn't read some of the words. Uh, 
so now I can read my speech. <laughs> uh, back to my point that the man who attacked Parliament Hill called himself a Muslim, but he did not share my faith. He did not share the faith of one and a half billion Muslims living in peace around the world. He did not share our, Mus our Islam, a religion of learning, compassion, and mercy. I am a Muslim, and I believe that if you pick up a gun in the name of Islam and kill an innocent person, you are not Muslim anymore. You and the person who, who attacked Parliament Hill and all these terrorists do not share my faith. Instead, <laughs> instead, he shared the hatred of the man who attacked Quebec City Mosque in January, killing six people while they were at prayer. The same hatred as the man who killed civilians and police officers in London three weeks ago. The same hatred as the men who killed 132 school children in Pakistan Army Public School in Peshawar. The same hatred as the men who shot me and my two school friends. These men have tried to divide us and destroy our democracies, our freedom of religion, our right to go to school. But we and you refuse to be divided. Canadians, wherever you are born, however you worship, stand together. And nothing proves this more than your commitment to refugees. Around the world, we have heard about Canada's heroes. We heard about the members of the First United Church here in Ottawa, who sponsored newlyweds Amina and Abraham. A few months later, the family had their first child, a little girl named Maria. The church decided to raise more money to bring Abraham's brother and family to Canada so Maria could grow up with her cousins. We heard about Jorge Salazar in Vancouver, who came to Canada as a child refugee, fleeing violence in Colombia. As a young adult, he's working with today's children, immigrants, and refugees, helping them adopt with the new culture and country. And I'm very proud to announce that Farah Muhammad, a refugee who fled Uganda and came to Canada as a child, is Malala Fund's new CEO, a Canadian who will now lead the fight for girls' education around the world. Many people from my own country of Pakistan have found a promised land in Canada, from Maria Topikai Wazir, a famous squash player, to my relatives here today. Like the refugees in Canada and all around the world, I have seen fear and experienced times when I did not know if I was safe or not. I remember how my mom used to put a ladder at the back of our house so that if anything happened, we could escape. I still remember that I would read a Quranic verse, Ayatul Kursi, every night to protect our family and as many people as I could. I felt fear when I went to school, thinking that someone would stop me and harm me. I would hide my books under my scarf. The sound of bombs would wake me up at night. Every morning I would hear the news that more innocent people have been killed. I saw men with big guns in the streets. There's more peace now in my home of Swat Valley, Pakistan, but families like mine, from Palestine to Venezuela, Somalia to Myanmar, Iraq to Congo, are forced to flee their homes because of violence. So your motto and your stand, welcome to Canada, is more than a headline or a hashtag. It is the spirit of humanity that every single one of us would yearn for if our family was in crisis. I pray that you continue to open your homes and your hearts to the world's most defenseless children and families, and I hope 
your neighbors will follow your example. to accept honorary citizenship of your country. While I will always be a proud Pashtun and a proud citizen of Pakistan, I am grateful to be an honorary member of your nation of heroes, though I still require a visa. <laughs> but that's another discussion. <laughs> I was also very happy to meet Prime Minister Trudeau this morning. I am amazed by his embrace of refugees, his commitment to appointing Canada's first gender-balanced cabinet, and his dedication to keeping women and girls at the centre of your development strategy. We have heard so much about Prime Minister Trudeau, but one thing has surprised me. People are always talking about how young he is. Uh, they say that he is the second youngest Prime Minister in Canada in Canadian history. He does yoga, he has tattoos, uh, and a lot more. Uh, and while I was coming here, everyone was telling me, like, shake Prime Minister's hand and, like, let us know how he looks in reality. And, and people were just so excited about meeting Trudeau. I, I don't think anyone cared about the Canadian honorary citizenship. <laughs> While, while it may be true that Prime Minister Trudeau is young and he is young head of government, I would like to tell something to the children of Canada, that you don't have to be as old as the very young Prime Minister Trudeau to be a leader. I'm like on still page seven, so there are like a lot left. So if you do the standing ovation again and again, you'll get tired. <laughs> Just to let you know, there's a lot left. But I want to share my story that I want to tell the children of Canada that when I was little, I used to wait to be an adult to lead. But I have learned that even a child, even a child's voice can be heard across the world. And to the young women of Canada, I want to say a step forward, raise your voices, and the next time I visit, I hope to see more of you filling these seats. And to the men of Canada, be proud feminists and help women get equal opportunities as men. And to the leaders of Canada today in this room, though you may have different politics and policies and priorities, I know each one of you is trying to respond to some of our world's most pressing problems. I have traveled the world and met many people in many countries. I have first-hand experience and I've seen many problems that we are facing today. War, economic instability, climate change, and health crisis. And I can tell you that the answer is girls. Secondary education can transform communities, countries, and our world. And here's what the statistics say. I'm saying it for those who still don't accept education as important. There are some, but I hope they will hear that if all girls went to school for 12 years, low- and middle-income countries could add $92 billion per year to their economies. Educated girls are less likely to, young, to marry young and contract HIV, and more likely to have he uh, healthy and educated children. 
The Brookings Institution called secondary education for girls as the most cost-effective and best investment against climate change. When a country gives all its children secondary education, they cut their risk of war in half. Education is vital for the security of the world because extremism grows alongside inequality. In places where people feel they have no opportunity, no voice, no hope. When women are educated, there are more jobs for everyone. When mothers can keep their children alive and send them to school, there is hope. But around the world, 130 million girls are out of school today. They may not have read the studies and they may not know the statistics, but they understand that education is the only path to a brighter future and they are fighting to go to school. Last summer, on a trip to Kenya, I was introduced to the bravest girl I have ever met. At age 13, Rahma's family fled Somalia and came to Dadaab, the world's largest refugee camp. She had never been inside a classroom, but she worked hard to catch up and in a few years graduated primary school. At 18, Rahma was introduced, was in secondary school when her parents decided to move back to Somalia. They promised she could continue her education. But when her family returned to Somalia, there were no schools for her to attend. Her father said her education was finished and that she would soon marry a man in his 50s, a man she did not know. Rahma remembered a friend from the refugee camp who had won a scholarship in a university in Canada. She borrowed a neighbor's internet and contacted him through Facebook. Over the internet, the university student in Canada sent her $70. At night, Rahma snuck out of her house, bought a bus ticket, and set out on an eight-day long trip back to the refugee camp, the only place she knew she could go to school. Through the Sustainable Development Goals, our nations promised every girl she would go to school for 12 years. We promised that donor countries and developing countries would work together to make this dream a reality for the poorest girls in the world. I know that politicians cannot keep every promise they make, but this is the one you must honor. World leaders can no longer expect girls like Rahma to, be, to fight this battle alone. We can gain peace, grow economies, improve our public health and the air we breathe or we can lose another generation of girls. I stand with girls as someone who knows what it is like to flee your home and wonder if you will ever be able to go back to school. I stand with girls as someone who knows how it feels to have the right of education taken away and your dreams threatened. I know where I stand. If you stand with me, I ask you to seize every opportunity for girls' education over the next year. Dear Canada, I'm asking you to lead once again. First, make girls' education a central theme of your G7 presidency next year. Second, use your influence to fill the global education funding gap. You raised billions of dollars and saved lives when you hosted the Global Funds Replenishment in Montreal last year. Show the same leadership for education. Host the upcoming replenishment of Global Partnership for Education, bring world leaders together and raise new funding for girls to go to school. If Canada leads, I know the world will follow. Finally, prioritize 12 years of education and schooling for refugees. Today, only a quarter of refugee children can get secondary education. We should not ask children who flee their homes to also give up their dreams. And we must recognize that young refugees are future leaders on whom, on whom we all depend for peace. The world needs leadership. The world needs leadership based on serving humanity, not based on how many weapons you have. Canada can take that lead. Our world has many problems, but we don't need to look far for the solution. We already have one. She is living in a refugee camp in Jordan 
She is walking five kilometers to school in Guatemala. She is suing footballs to pay enrollment fees in India. She is every one of the girls out of school around the world today. We know what to do, but we must look inside ourselves for the will to keep our promises. Dear sisters and brothers, we have a responsibility to improve the world. When future generations read about us in their books or on their iPads or whatever the next innovation will be, I don't want them to be shocked that 130 million girls could not go to school and we did nothing. I don't want them to be shocked that we did not stand up for child refugees as millions of families fled their homes. I don't want us to be known for failing them. Let the future generations say we were the ones who stood up. Let them say we were the first ones. We were the first to live in a world where all girls could learn and lead without fear. Let us be the ones who bring that change we want to see. Thank you so much for listening. Yusuf Sai addressing a joint session of the House of uh, Parliament in Ottawa. Earlier, she became the sixth ever honorary Canadian citizen, kissing her mom and dad there who joined her on this trip and receiving the applause of a packed House of Commons, a packed gallery, and a standing ovation. We heard Malala not only in uh, the earnest tone of her voice asking Canada to be a leader once again in putting girls' education first, but we also heard some humour because she said <laughs> that she was very humbly able and willing and happy to accept the citizenship, the honorary Canadian citizenship that was given to her, but that she still needed a visa to visit Canada. And then you heard the applause of this uh, House, which includes members of Parliament, it includes members of the Senate. And it includes a full gallery. We'll just listen in to the end of this ceremony. to be just a spontaneous eruption of our national anthem. This is a uh, joint session, so we have the Senate here, the MPs, Malala. we have a packed gallery, as you can see, Minister, and uh, I've got Evan Dyer just outside of those doors to the Chief House Justice. of Commons. He certainly was watching all of Excellent the uh, events Lord unfold. Senators, there will be some other speeches, but we've heard from the Prime Minister, we've heard from Malala Yousafzai, and Evan, let me ask you for your thoughts and what stood out for you in particular. Well, I, you, we had a bit of everything, didn't we? We had some humour, uh, the visa comment also telling 
uh, the assembled members and senators to stop doing standing ovations, saying you people are going to get tired if you keep doing that. Uh, but also some very serious words, and, and they reminded us of exactly why it was so important to the Taliban to try to kill Malala Yousafzai and why they would still very much like to kill her today. Uh, her comments about terrorists and religious extremists, of course, uh, continue to put her in danger from a lot of people in her home country who would like to kill her for uh, pretty much everything she stands for, from the fact that she insists on girls' education to even the rather relaxed way that she wears her hijab. So uh, she's definitely shown, again, you know, the kind of force that she represents uh, for, for her mission, that very single-minded mission that she has. You know, uh, it's interesting to see her there with her parents and to reflect on just exactly where she really comes from. She comes from the most conservative corner, really, of Pakistan, perhaps one of the most patriarchal societies in the world. So she said, receiving her citizenship, and again in the speech there, I'm accepting it not only as a proud citizen of Pakistan, but as a Pashtun coming from that tribal uh, mm -hmm. society in, in uh, Khyber, Pakhtunkhwa, and uh, being herself a member of Yusufzai, one of the biggest of the Pashtun tribes, uh, coming from an area where, as she mentioned this morning in high school, girls aren't even included in the family tree. She's the first girl in her own family's family tree uh, put there at the insistence of her father. And I was struck by the fact that she had, uh, in mixed in with that humor and, and those sort of grateful remarks for being made a citizen, a pretty specific laundry list, too, of requests from Canada. Her asks, including things like asking Canada to uh, assemble other countries and take charge of raising more money for the Global Partnership for Education, and also uh, to make girls' education a priority when Canada chairs the G7 next year. Uh, and lastly, asking for Canada to prioritize 12 years of education uh, for every refugee, boys and girls, to make sure that those kids in refugee camps like Dadaab, the world's biggest camp, which he visited in Kenya and spoke about in the speech, to make sure that those kids can see it through to the end of high school so that after uh, growing up in a refugee camp, they have a, a shot at life. And uh, she herself is someone who's, who's experienced what it feels like to be driven out of your home because she was indeed driven out of her home by the Taliban, uh, separated from her family, uh, even prior to that murder attempt where she was shot. And lastly, fascinating to look at her and just to think, this is still a schoolgirl. This is a girl who's actually still in high school. She's at Edgebaston Secondary School in Birmingham. Although she's 19, of course, she's had many delays in her education, uh, being shot and having to go through a subsequent recovery, one of them, uh, but also having to work as a UN ambassador of peace, globe trotting, uh, carrying her message around the world. It's, uh, it's definitely... Uh, quite a busy schedule for someone who's also trying to graduate from high school, but there you go, she seems to be doing it all. And she intends, uh, as I understand it, to attend university in the UK after, as you mentioned, she finishes high school. And, yeah. and Evan, you talked about her sending a specific message to uh, elected officials when it comes to Canada taking a lead role in, in, uh, in girls' education, but she also spoke, it seemed, directly to Canadian men, saying, be proud feminists. She spoke yeah two young women she said this is the message raise your voice step forward and in fact looked around that house of commons and said the next time i visit i hope to see more of you meaning young women filling these seats and the, up in the gallery there were many young women listening those who have perhaps read i am malala the book that was presented to the uh, librarian uh, earlier in the ceremony where she received her honorary citizenship um, but there's a personal story for you evan when it comes to young women deciding this is who i want to see today Yes, I guess that's true. My daughter is up in the gallery there. She uh, was not part of an official high school delegation. On the contrary, she actually uh, skipped out of school. I gave her permission to do that because uh, she really wanted to see Malala. Yes, in fact, she, when she found out Malala was coming, I was quite struck by the strength of her reaction. Uh, she absolutely was determined to be here, so I wasn't going to stand in her way. And uh, yeah, I'm curious, curious to hear her impressions of the speech. She's a big fan. You know, I spoke with a, a high school student in Ottawa. Her name is Emma Boys, and uh, she is 17. She said Malala really inspired her. In fact, she's going on to university next year. She wants to study political science. She's, in fact, considering politics. Perhaps she will be one of those women in the seats Malala referred to in her speech. I just want to ask you about the, um, the ripple effect. I mean, your daughter, this young woman that I spoke with earlier on CBC News Network, where does it go from here? 
Well, one of the lines that struck me in the speech that Malala gave was, was very much addressed at children. And it was to say, uh, in effect, don't dream about what you're going to be when you grow up. You're already able to do something right now. And of course, her own life is an example of that because she has been influencing public opinion and world events uh, since about the age of 10. When you link, think back to when she began uh, to be known, it was for that blog that she put on the BBC. She was that lone voice coming out of the Swat Valley, telling people what was happening there at a time when nobody could really get in or out. The whole place was locked down by the Taliban. Uh, and already she was starting to have an effect at that age. After uh, becoming internationally known, after, after the assassination attempt, of course, that impact only became bigger. And so that message to kids that, you know, you don't have to wait even until you legally have the vote to start influencing life in your country, uh, I think is a very powerful one. And I can see from, you know, talking to kids my daughter's age, she's 15, my youngest daughter, 10, who've read the book uh, and who've discussed it in school, that it's a message that, that young kids are very receptive to. Evan, pleasure having you uh, co-host uh, this on CBC News Network, and I thank you for that. That's CBC's Evan Dyer in Ottawa. So Thanks. you've been watching this unfold live on CBC News Network. I can tell you once again, just in case you missed it, we do have a new honorary Canadian citizen. Her name is Malala Yousafzai.